Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Gabar, who gave me the opportunity to hey, Gabar, to uh, talk about this, uh, which is probably the most important project in my life, uh, even though it is uh, a strange one. So I have a colleague from Berkeley, and I told him that I'm going to tell him something that is going to surprise him. And he said, I'm very skeptical by nature. I've heard a lot. So I told him that, and he said, you surprised me. So uh, prepare to be surprised. And um, the challenge is to surprise you in 20 minutes. I never try to put uh, uh, so much material in 20 minutes talk. So please bear with me. Uh, despite the lack of time, I still want you to take back the whole way to the beginning of the Western science. It starts with Pythagoras who lived two and a, thousand, two and a half thousand years ago. We don't even know how exactly it looked. This one is at least uh, made at least 500 years after his death. But what we know is that his disciples said that he said that all things were numbers. He also said that there is a harmony in the spheres. So um, he was also known for Pythagoras' theorem that um, gives rise to uh, geometry, also gives rise to the number pi. And pi is for Pythagoras. Uh, this is uh, one of the fantastic numbers, and for a long time, mathematicians were fascinated with, uh, with it and with the decimal expansion. And they look at these uh, digits of the decimal expansion as an example of pseudo-random uh, sequence, which has no uh, order. But uh, maybe there is a hidden harmony in these numbers. And if you read the historical, this, the work of this professor of uh, uh, UCLA, you will learn that uh, actually if you map by, uh, binary expansion of pi, and he uses a complicated map, but if you do that, and this is 10-fold symmetry, which is made artificially, so uh, uh, it's not so important. What's important is that there is a repeating, uh, repeating patterns. And if you um, change when every one hundred, uh, ten thousandth bit in this binary expansion randomly, if you randomize it, the whole picture goes away and you get just a blurry image. So that means that there is uh, an order in the expansion of pi and there is a symmetry or order or harmony that can be revealed by proper mapping. So this is a table that is known to all mass spectrometrists, and I know that there are many people here in mass spectrometry, so we use this table of masses and abundances of, of isotopes. Um, and uh, this is probably the most boring table in mass spectrometry, but it's also quite exciting one if you ask a question, is there harmony or symmetry hidden in these numbers. And in order to answer this question, we need a mapping. So this is a, a mapping that we came up with. It uses the fact that mass of a molecule consisting of uh, several elements, like say CH or N, uh, is not just a number. It's an isotopic distribution where the first peak, the lightest, is called monoisotopic. It consists of uh, uh, all um, uh, dominant and single isotopes, C12 and 14 and so on. Uh, uh, and it's different, uh, its position is different compared to the nominal mass, which is integer mass, and this difference is called mass defect. And for peptides and proteins, the mass defect is positive. And the average isotopic mass is the centroid of this distribution, and the difference between the center and the beginning is called isotopic shift. So uh, if we looked, look at these two values, one referring to the mass defect, we take the mass defect, divide by the nominal mass, multiply for a good measure by 1,000, called normalized mass, we get normalized mass defect. Uh, or if we take the average mass minus monoisotopic divided by nominal, we get normalized isotopic shift. These two values are independent of each other because uh, the first one refers to the binding energy of the nuclei and uh, all these digits after decimal point of the main isotope. It's the same number over the whole universe. And the second number refers to the abundance of the most abundant isotope, 
which is very easy to change. And the whole conference is about this. So then these two numbers should be independent. And therefore, we did not expect to see any order when we plotted the masses for 3,000 molecules. These are peptides from mouse kidney. The same picture you get when you plot E. coli peptides or any organism. What you see here is a random distribution, random, but then there is, a, there is a line and a gap. So we call it resonance. And we first thought it was an artifact because it implies a linear correlation for the molecules which are on the line between the um, monoisotopic mass, which is a universal constant, and the average isotopic mass, uh, uh, which is um, more or less constant within this planet. Um, but even, even uh, within the planet, you know, there, there are big changes in the biology uh, and uh, in chemistry. So um, to cut the long story short, it turns out that molecules on the line um, follow the simple rule Z equal to zero, where Z is an index corresponding to C minus N plus H over two. It does not correspond to any previously known uh, chemical index, but there are uh, millions of them. So um, uh, what, is, what is so special about Z equal to zero? If you look at the uh, distribution of the organic molecules found in meteorites, this is data from, from a collaborator from Munich, you'll see that z equal to zero is, um, um, is a singular value. That's the value um, to which uh, the distribution tends. It's the, it's the peak. And there's another data set coming from uh, Hungarian, so Hungarian connection. Art but Samod, he's now in the University of Arizona. Uh, he gave this, uh, this data set to me um, uh, recently, and this is um, a Titan, which is a satellite of Saturn, and they uh, simulated its atmosphere and created uh, these molecules containing CHNN, and this uh, plotted the distribution, and Z equal to zero corresponds to the maximum of the distribution. So this is a kind of, uh, um, kind of a, maximum to which the prebiotic chemistry converges. And we'll look at the amino acids that have Z equal to zero. It turns out now, it turns out that nine out of 20 amino acids have Z equal to zero. And what are these amino acids? These are the first ones uh, that were produced abiotically. So Stanley Miller, who designed his experiment with uh, Harold Urey in 1953, they found these amino acids preferentially uh, in this, in this um, seminal experiment. So when life first originated on this planet, that's a common belief today that it did not operate all 20 amino acids. It did not use amino acids containing sulfur, methionine, and cysteine. Neither did it use aromatic amino acids like tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine. So there was a shorter um, shorter alphabet, probably 10 to 12 amino acids. So uh, if you replot this distribution, removing these new amino acids, you'll get things which are concentrated more on the line. So the line is really prevailing feature. And we formulated this isotopic resonance hypothesis um, that postulated that uh, if there is uh, this feature has any meaning, that this meaning could be that it leads to increase of kinetics. And the increase of kinetics goes through the reduction of complexity. And if this is true, then early life has benefited from the presence of this terrestrial isotopic resonance. Uh, indeed, uh, so where does the reduction of complexity come from? In order to describe a molecular mass containing CH or N, you need 14 parameters. You need to know all these numbers but if you, the molecules are on the line, in order to describe the average isotopic mass, you only need to know monoisotopic masses and the parameters of the lines. Six parameters, and if the slope is equal to zero, then five. So there's a great reduction in complexity. I'm referring to Schrodinger's equation, I'm referring to Hamiltonian, and the number of quantum mechanical states. So what we did here is we plotted the same uh, distribution of molecules, but each time we changed the isotopic composition of just one element, oxygen 18, and you, what you see is that the straight lines, the small resonances appear all the time, but the big one is only formed 
when we're approaching the isotopic composition compared to other average terrestrial values. So um, uh, we've done uh, this work on um, testing the isotopic resonance, but it will be easier if we uh, um, plot the resonance in a different scale when we st stop looking at the uh, uh, lines and start to look at uh, spectra. So in order to do that, uh, a program was created that calculates the number of dots on the, um, the, the, the line and, the, and the calculate the maximum number of dots on, on the line that you can draw through any two points. So that's how it works. It calculates this value and it's corresponding to complexity reduction and then it changes the isotopic composition of some element. You see the distribution slightly changed. It's becoming more compact, so more molecules are on the line. Their complexity reduction is decreases. Uh, further, further decrease, you have now re really a good alignment, but then it uh, becomes diffuse. So that's how this program works. And if you do this scan using C13 content, that's what you see. Uh, you see this, uh, first of all, what you see is that there are many resonances, but they have different uh, abundance. So the Z equal to zero resonance, this one, is the strongest. And we actually off this resonance for C13, we're off quite a bit. We're off about 25, 30%. There is also a resonance corresponding to 0.33% uh, of C13. That's depletion. Uh, and, uh, and there is also resonance corresponding to the current uh, average composition. So they will go back to that. It's a small resonance here. Our theory uh, suggests that when the isotopic resonance appears, the rate of chemical reactions uh, change, mostly increase. So uh, uh, the conventional theory, the null hypothesis, says that the rate will remain the same or will slightly go down as the primary kinetic effect, as Justin has said, is such that as uh, the percentage of heavy isotope increases, the reaction goes slower. So we tested the hypothesis by growing E. coli, and um, the question was why? It's because E. coli grows on a minimal media. The minimal media contains just a source of carbon. It could be glucose, could be just amino acid, could be even uh, some acids, and then, uh, and then some inorganic salts, and it converts the simple material to highly organized biological material, so using millions of reactions. And um, you can measure the growth rate of E. coli very accurately. This is a real, not simulated growth curve. What do you measure? You measure three parameters. First is the lag time. The shorter the lag time, uh, the better uh, the growth. Then you measure the maximum slope and you measure the maximum density. Again, the higher the slope, uh, the, be the better is the growth and the, 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 larger, the higher is the density, the better is the growth. So you have three domains of measurements. And we tested several resonances, and uh, one of them is this 0.33% of C13, and we found resonance with a pretty good va value, and this is growth rate. We also saw similar on, um, uh, on in other domains. I would not bother you with all, all the data, but the, one of the biggest resonances that we predicted was this. The deuterium content is normal. But the uh, uh, C13 is about 11%, N15 is about 13%, and O18 is about 6.6%. If you plug these numbers, uh, then you have this, uh, all, these all these dots become one single line with a slope minus one. And in this particular composition, what happens is that the average isotopic mass becomes proportional to the nominal mass, and nominal mass is integer. This is a great reduction in complexity, and we should see a big effect. And indeed, we saw a big effect, a big increase in growth. So the lag time went down, the maximum density went up, and the lag, uh, sorry, the lag time went down, the maximum growth rate went up, and the maximum density went up. All three parameters corresponding to, um, to increase in growth. So bacteria found this particular isotopic composition incredibly advantageous. And of course, we did all the proper controls, it was um, not easy to publish, but uh, we published this recently. So it's published uh, in March in scientific reports. So um, 
Now, what, is the, what are the conclusions? If we do the deuterium scan here, we find that we are pretty off the main resonance. Uh, and so the main resonance is found about 300, 350 ppm of deuterium. So our predictions is that if you increase the deuterium content, then you should see faster growth rate. And if you decrease, then you go further away from the resonance, main resonance. And that's what we call slow water. This is what uh, most people here are interested. But there is a region of, of faster growth that should be a region of faster growth, which we call fast water. And then when you uh, deplete deuterium con uh, continuously, then the complexity goes down again and the rate should increase. So uh, we started to look at the um, um, evidence for that and start to look at literature and couldn't find anything in the beginning. It turned out that the literature was older than we expected. And uh, Valentin Lobachev here, he's published this in 1970s. They, they look at a particular reaction, sodium potassium ATPase, the activity goes up by 50% uh, at about 400 ppm, so that corresponds to fast water. So that's this amazing, amazing result, 50% increase. We never saw uh, anything like that with, with E. coli. And of course, Garber's old results, uh, he, he found um, you know, decrease of the growth of cancer cells, and that's what he's interested in, but there is also an increase at higher deuterium content, this is what we're interested in. And this is one of the amazing, most amazing things that I've seen. This is again from Gabber's work when, um, when the um, deuterium content drops by just 20, 25%. Uh, this is a rat model, you know well about that. This is from the patent. Uh, the uh, level of glucose in serum drops. Uh, it's like the biological system falls off the cliff. How can you explain that by any kind of kinetic isotopic effects? And then the effect reverses itself. So, um, but uh, going back to the fact that uh, we seem to be sitting, if you plug in the average isotopic composition, seem to be sitting on some kind of a small resonance. Uh, so we, uh, we tried to get as accurate data as possible for isotopic compositions and took the NIST values. And NIST gives you two values, most representative and best measured and we took the average between them it turns out that we uh, the our planet indeed is is sitting on a resonance that is uh, well defined and uh, that may explain why we haven't drifted towards the big resonance the resonances they're like magnets they attract systems so we are there are many resonances on the way and, we, and the, every large biological system seem to be uh, sitting on a on a kind of a resonance so that's about Earth. What about other planets? Other planets have amazingly different isotopic compositions, especially in terms of deuterium. We are here. Uh, the Moon is about the same. Mars has five times more deuterium. Venus has 100 times more deuterium. Other planets have a lower amount of deuterium. What is similar to Earth is, uh, again, a Titan. Titan is uh, similar to Earth. And this is, uh, again, um, satellite of, of uh, Saturn and is believed to be one that may harbor life. But what about Mars, our closest uh, neighbor that we can explore? Uh, the isotopic compositions of the Martian atmosphere has been measured very accurately, and not least by Curiosity rover. And if you plot this, you see small, small resonances, but nothing big, nothing corresponding to Z equal to zero. And uh, therefore, uh, well, there is a small resonance that Mars is located at, but there is no big resonances nearby. So our own conclusion is that the life on Mars is unlikely. So sorry, NASA, but um, you know, scientists has to go where the theory tells him to. Returning back to Pythagoras, we seem to be uh, uh, experiencing this harmony of spheres when the uh, the numbers coming from the isotopes, you know, the atomic numbers uh, lead to conclusions that are applicable for the whole planets. So these are the conclusions. Uh, I guess they, the talk is short enough so I don't have to repeat them. Uh, the isotopic resonance hypothesis is no longer a hypothesis because it has been proven to um, such a good p-value that it's, uh, uh, it's a phenomenon now. And um, it can be used in a variety of ways, and it's been used and by Gabor for already 20 years. 
So uh, thanks, my, I would like to thank my group and collaborator and thank you for your attention.